In 1943, during World War II, the United States Air Force was experiencing high rates of casualties. American bombers were being taken down in large numbers by German anti-air defense forces. Men were not returning home. In an attempt to minimize the losses, the U.S. military sought the help of the Statistical Research Group, aka the SRG, at Columbia University. Abraham Wald, a mathematician at SRG, was tasked with determining where to reinforce the planes with armor to reduce the number of casualties. He was given data on where all the planes that returned back from their missions were shot. When plotted on a single image, it looks something like this. With the data in hand, Wald set to work. Indie games are big, and you probably already know that. Some of the biggest video games released in the last decade that you've probably played have been made by indie developers. The thing is, most of those games aren't really indie, at least not according to the original definition. You see, indie games are so big now that the term indie has morphed in meaning. Originally, indie meant a game made independently, typically by a small team. No publisher, no investors, just the team in their game. But now when you hear indie game, you're less likely to think of the conditions of development and more likely to think of it as a whole genre of games with a certain type of vibe. Some intangible quality that just feels indie. Most games you would consider successful indie games today wouldn't have been considered indie at all a few years ago. They're often made by larger teams with bigger budgets, funded by publishers or other investors, and given access to resources that wouldn't have been available to anyone outside of a major studio a decade ago. There's a particular point in time where I think this shift started to happen, and that point in time starts with... Indie Game the Movie is a cultural touchstone for indie games. Released in 2012, the film follows three indie games and their developers. Braid by Jonathan Blow, Fez by Phil Fish and Renal Bedard, and Super Meat Boy by Edmund McMillan and Tommy Refinus. These games are three of the earliest examples of truly successful indie games. So early that the release of these three games and this movie is when I think indie game went from not just a description of the conditions of development, but to a description of genre. Before these games were released, indie game wasn't really a term most people were familiar with or used to describe games. Indie games existed, of course, but nothing that had the likes of Soldier Boy playing them online. <laughs> hey, Soldier Boy, Soldier Boy, tell them. Hey, they got this game, right, for people who smoke or people who drink. It ain't got no point to the game. You just walk around jumping on shit. People like, oh, shit, I'm gonna die. <laughs> 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 Of the three games featured in the movie, Super Meat Boy has the most complete narrative arc, beginning with development and ending with release. We watch Edmund and Tommy go through development of the game until they're offered a great opportunity. Xbox, Super Meat Boy's launch platform, is willing to include the game in a new promotion called Game Feast. The catch? The promotion is in two months, far sooner than the four or so months that the game would need to actually be ready to release. Well, no big deal, they can just skip the promotion and release at the original time, right? If they miss this date, they can't launch for so much longer afterwards that they would run out of money and become financially ruined. The pair end up crunching in order to get the game out in time for the promotion. If you're not familiar with what crunch is, it's a term that refers to a typically months-long period of chronic overwork. We watch the pair's mental and emotional health greatly suffer as they do this. Edmund talks about how in the height of crunch on Super Meat Boy, the only way he could find some solace was by filling the bathtub with hot water and then laying in it until it went cold. It was a grueling time for the pair, but sure enough, they came out the other side with the finished game, shipped in time for the promotion. In a bit of poetic cruelty, they didn't even get the promotion in the exact form they were promised, and what they did get was late anyway. But it thankfully didn't matter, since Super Meat Boy went on to outsell Braid and become one of the best-selling XBLA games of all time. Indie games have gotten so big that in 2021, of the over 11,000 games that were released on Steam, 98% of them were indie games. Sadly though, only 8% of all the games released sold over 10,000 copies. For some perspective, if you sold 10,000 copies of a game on Steam at, say, $5 a copy, you'd be looking at $50,000 in gross revenue. Pretty sweet for a solo dev, right? Well, when you factor in Steam's 30% cut, about 15,000, and then factor in income tax, let's just call it 20% to simplify things, 
you're looking at net revenue of $28,000. That may still sound like a lot to you, but that is not enough to live on in most of the US. Not only that, but that's not considering how the game will sell in the following years, especially when most of a game's sales typically happen in the first month of release. It also doesn't consider how much it costs to build the game. If you paid for licenses for any tools, or contracted anyone to help, you'd have to remove that from your profit as well. Very quickly, you can start to see how it's really not all that much money. Your game that sold 10,000 copies probably doesn't even break even. Imagine how much worse it is when you don't even sell 10,000 to begin with. If you look on social media, especially YouTube or Reddit, you'll find hundreds of posts from indie game developers with games that commercially failed discussing what they think went wrong with their game, trying to attribute their game's failure to something tangible and within their control, an attempt to rationalize their failure. They attempt to put these factors into a concrete list. Even though they failed this time, they figured out what went wrong. Silly me, they say. I simply didn't market my game. Now I know that I need to market my game, so next time I'll succeed. I'll finally be able to go full-time indie. If I just post harder, I'll be fine. If you're also someone who makes games, it can be easy to read these posts and get a little smug. How foolish of them. Clearly this game was going to fail from the start. Their art sucks. My game's art doesn't suck. And I know how to market my game. I won't fail because I know better. I'm just like all the successful indie game devs. The world just doesn't know it yet. Ironically, in the comments of many of these posts, or even in posts of their own, you'll see commercially successful indie game developers warn others to avoid taking the same path. They offer a tough-to-swallow pill of realism. That there is no pot of gold at the end of the metaphorical indie game rainbow. Instead, it's a pot of instant ramen noodles and a life of just barely scraping by. Even if you sell tens of thousands of copies of your game, which is already putting you in the top 10% of games, Chances are, it's not enough to really live on, never mind save for retirement. Yet despite all of that, despite all the post-mortems on failed games, despite the financial realities, despite the odds being so stacked against success, and despite all the warnings from those who were successful, people still want to do it. For every warning or failed game post-mortem, there's probably 10 posts of would-be indies asking, how do I make a game? Where do I start? How much money can you make as an indie game dev? Something is not clicking. It seems like more people than ever want to make indie game development their full-time job, even when the overwhelming evidence says that they should not. When the military presented the data on where US planes were being shot the most to Wald, they thought it was obvious. The plane should be reinforced where the most red dots are. That's where the planes are getting shot at the most, so it would make sense to reinforce those areas with armor, right? Well, not exactly. Walt figured out that the areas to reinforce were the ones with no damage. The logic being that the planes who were shot in those areas never made it back to be part of the data set to begin with. There's no dots on the engine, not because the planes weren't getting shot there, but because those planes never even made it back at all. Wald proposed reinforcing the engines with additional armor, and it ended up saving American lives. Now, the story likely didn't go down exactly like that. In my research, I learned that Wald actually used a statistical model to determine that the engine was the most likely area to be hit and the most likely to cause the plane to go down. He didn't just look at the image of dots on a plane and use superior facts and logic to outsmart the military. I told you the romanticized version of the story because it's used as one of the primary examples to illustrate how survivorship bias plays out in real-world scenarios. Survivorship bias is the logical error of concentrating on the people or things that made it past some selection process and overlooking those that did not, typically because of their lack of visibility. To give a relevant example, looking at successful YouTubers and assuming that it's reasonably achievable to also become a successful YouTuber is survivorship bias. It's easy to listen to successful YouTubers' How I Made It on YouTube stories and think it's possible for you to do it too. Often they have similar stories, they just started uploading good videos and people flock to their channels. Maybe they attribute it to good SEO or following trendy video topics. All of that advice can sound really basic, because it is. The problem is that you're missing the stories of the millions of people who try and fail to also become successful on YouTube. You have survivorship bias. 
You're only hearing from the people who already made it and not nearly enough from the people who didn't. Because they didn't make it. There's millions of people who have made really good videos that you'll never watch and that pretty much no one will ever watch. Unfortunately, it's statistically far more likely that you will never be a successful YouTuber. Even more relevant to our main topic, it is statistically far more likely that you will never be a successful indie game developer than it is that you will succeed as one. Most of the stories you hear are success stories. Unless you're looking for them, you probably don't hear any of the failure stories. And even if you do hear them, it's easy to dismiss them because they seem so rare. The failures aren't visible precisely because they're failures. You're working with incomplete data. Indie Game the Movie contributes to the survivorship bias of indie games. None of the developers failed in the movie. They all went on to not only have their games succeed, but they as individuals became household names in the industry. I believe it was an intentional decision on the filmmaker's part as well. Because here's the secret. Indie Game the Movie wasn't always about these games and their developers. In fact, it was originally about a whole group of indies and all of their games. You can see remnants of this in the beginning of the movie when other folks are interviewed about indie games as a whole. Those interview segments eventually dry up and the narrative moves to focus entirely on the developers of the three main games. The movie came out as well as it did because of how they changed the focus from indie games as a whole to these three specific ones. It made for better pacing and a more interesting story. It follows the hero's journey rather than being a purely informational documentary. You end up only seeing the ones who were successful. Now, let's put aside the likelihood of success in indie games for a moment. Even if success were easily achievable, what's really in it for you? Sticking with the examples in Indie Game the Movie, Edmund and Tommy severely crunched for several months straight. Try sleeping for only a couple hours a night and spending nearly all of your waking hours working. Not talking to friends or family, not spending any real time with your significant other, not playing games, not watching TV, not doing anything but working. Now do that over and over every day of the week, including weekends, for several months in a row. Now, add on the pressure that if you don't do that, no matter how exhausted you get, how beaten and broken down you become, that you will lose your job. That's sadly the reality for many people in the games industry, indie or not. But now add on the indie angle of the pressure. Not only will you lose your job, but you'll be financially ruined like in thousands of dollars of debt and with little to no safety net of any kind, kind of ruined. Like you have thousands of dollars of debt because you've overdraft by buying Coke Zero every day, one of the only small pleasures keeping you going, kind of debt. That's what Edmund and Tommy went through when making Super Meat Boy. And so many successful indies have gone through the same thing. Rame Ismail and JW of the now defunct Flambeer talk about how they also spent months just eating ramen noodles and working on games. The truly sad part is that so many folks who have failed have gone through the same thing as well. Their stories just don't end with the best-selling game. Yet, it's easy to watch Indie Game the movie and walk away with this feeling that it was all worth it. That you'd do the same thing if given the chance. Maybe you're like 14-year-old me and think, Hey, it's hard, but anything worth doing is hard. At least you'd be doing something you love. To be honest, I've rewatched the movie several times over the years, and I did it again for this video, and I still found myself walking away thinking, man, that would be pretty awesome. And that's no mistake, it's a really well done movie, and I don't think it would have done as well as it did if the Super Meat Boy story ended with the game failing. It would have likely been too depressing for most people to want to watch anyway. So what, you may be asking? The odds aren't great, but clearly some people are still able to do it. There's gotta be something that they did that set them apart from the crowd. And you're right. All of these developers did have things that set them apart from everyone else. Jonathan Blow had parents who supported his interest in programming at an early age, had already started an indie game company with a friend and failed, gaining first-hand experience in running a company and what not to do, was supporting himself as an independent games contractor, had made dozens of prototype games, and was known in the games community for starting the Experimental Games Workshop at GDC and writing a monthly column for Game Developer. Phil Fish had parents who supported and even shared his interest in art and games at an early age. For example, his dad translated Zelda 1 into French so they could play it together. He worked at Ubisoft as a level designer for a time, worked with Renal Bedard, among others, on Fez, had a grant from the Canadian government to make Fez, won an IGF award for Fez before it even released, and then released Fez after Indie Game the Movie came out. Edmund had been making indie games for years, helping to make the cult classic Gish, he made a ton of Flash games like Ether, Timefuck, and Meat Boy, and he was the original artist and animator on Braid, though his work was later replaced by David Hellman's. 
Tommy had professional experience as an engineer in software, and he later moved to games and worked on porting Unreal Engine 2 and Hoop World for WiiWare. Super Meat Boy as a game had an Xbox timed exclusivity deal. You might notice that none of the factors I mentioned have anything to do with the quality of the games. They're all really about the circumstances of these developers' lives. And I'm not trying to somehow shame these developers or say, aha, see, they didn't really do any hard work, their games weren't actually good, they just had all of these factors that gave them a head start. They are all incredibly talented people who work tirelessly to make incredible games, and they deserve every ounce of praise and recognition for that. My point is that when watching something like Indie Game the Movie, or when looking at just the successful part of someone's story, you miss the bigger picture. You miss all the little factors that help them set up for success in the first place. You focus on the end result, not the journey. If you want to see what happens to the people who don't succeed, Surviving Indie by James Cook takes a look at what happens to those who don't make it out to the other side of success in indie games. Spoilers, it doesn't end well. It would be great if there was a way to identify the engine on the metaphorical plane of indie game success. If we were just able to point to the area with no dots on all the successful indie games and say, right there, that's where everyone else needs to put more effort and then their games will succeed too. Sadly though, there's really not. If anything, if they're being honest, most successful indies would say that that engine is luck. And while luck can feel like this intangible quality, unable to be affected by our efforts, yet able to affect us in every way, I do think it's possible to improve your luck, however incrementally. For example, you can develop strong skills in one or more areas of game development, form a really skilled team that works well together, post as much content about your game as possible online, or even show up to as many local events and expos as possible. None of these things replace making a really good game that people want to play, but they do help ever so slightly in making sure that people do end up playing the game you make. There's also something to be said about making games just for the pure fun of making games. All this time, we've really been talking about commercial indie games. If you're making games as a hobby, it doesn't matter whether people buy it and play it or not, if the goal is just creative expression. And really, that's what's at the heart of it all. It's why so many people want to make indie games, why Indie Game the Movie is so inspirational. It's that intangible quality that has made indie games a genre of their own.